Changing up the order a little bit, we're going to have a little more time at the end of our service so we can pray together and really seek the Lord in prayer. Um, this week, uh, boy, this week, I, I, this week, I heard a story that it just, it just kind of wrecked me this week. I've been thinking about it all week long, wanted to share it with you today. We're just going to jump right in and start off with this. So, um, heard the story of a guy named James Frazier. Uh, James was a missionary, and in 1908, he graduated from a university in England. He had a great future ahead of him. Um, he, he was not only an accomplished pianist, but was uh, ready for a, um, a career. I believe it was engineering, but after his graduation, he just sensed that God wanted him to pick up and move and go to China and serve God as a missionary to China and tell people in China about Jesus. So he moves to China, and um, he tells people about Jesus, and he shares Jesus, and he labored and labored and labored. He worked hard to learn the language, to learn the culture and understand the culture, and even translate some of the Bible into, uh, into the language so folks could, could read it and understand it and have portions of the Scripture. He worked for six years, and nobody turned their lives over to Christ. He was, he was discouraged. He was frustrated. But then finally started people, started, started, started coming, to, coming to Christ and giving their lives to Christ. And uh, well, then in this one particular episode, he was serving in, um, in the, the Lisu uh, area, which is several hundred miles west of Wuhan, in the foothills of the, Him of the Himalayas. And so he had, he had several small villages, and in these villages, there were a few converts and a few follow, Christ followers in each of the villages, and he would go from village to village teaching and preaching and discipling those who had, had given their lives to Christ and telling other people about Jesus. Well, when the winter months came, he's kind of, you know, these villages are situated in the foothills of the Himalayas, and winter would come, the snow would fall, and it would really block his access to the, the villages in the highlands. And he would get frustrated over this, and James was known to kind of complain about it and get frustrated and just kind of complain that, uh, you, know, you know, God, why? You even kind of get frustrated with God, right? Like, God, why, um, God, why didn't you stop the snow? God, why didn't you keep, you know, keep the path open? We've got all these brand new followers of Jesus, and they're, they're young in their faith, and they want to know more about you, and I can't go there and teach them, preach, and disciple them. And, and he felt a challenge from God. And he kind of just realized, okay, this is God's problem. God could have stopped it, but he didn't. So God's going to have to solve this problem. So he kind of thought through and he realized it would take him three to five days to travel to the villages. A couple of days to get there. One day to preach and teach and hold services. A couple of days to travel home. And so he thought, since I cannot travel to the highland villages um, who are up in, up in higher, 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 higher elevations, I'm going to take those three to five days and just pray. Pray for those villages, pray for those Christ followers in those villages, and pray like crazy since I can't go visit them. And so he took his three to five days when he would normally go preach and teach, and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. Prayed for each of the villages. Well, you can imagine when springtime came that he was eager to find out the, the kind of the condition and how they were doing and whether or not they had stayed faithful and had grown maybe, or if they had just all kind of turned, kind of turned back because they were so young in their faith. And so the snow melted, and he got there as quickly as he can, and here's what he discovered, that these young followers of Jesus who were young in their faith during the winter months, even though they were isolated from their teacher and discipler, that they had been reading their Bibles and praying just like he had taught them, and that they were being discipled, and he discovered that the followers of Jesus in the highlands had not only grown in their faith, I mean, they had not only not walked back, that they had grown in their faith, but they had grown more in their faith than the villagers in the lowlands where he had been discipling and teaching them all winter, all winter long. I read this, well, I heard it on a podcast and I read the article that they referenced and this pastor who kind of shared this story, pastors a church in London and he called it the, the coronavirus experiment. And he said, you know, in these days where maybe we can't see each other, we can't meet each other, and this article was written, of course, months and months ago when restrictions were even different, more and we were, you know, even more distant. And he was saying, in these days when we can't be as close together, meeting as often as we exactly as we would like, maybe this is time for us to realize that while we would like to meet together, that God is not hindered by distance and that there is work to be done in prayer Here's, here's, what, here's what Fraser said. He said, if I were to think after the manner of men, in, in other words, if I were to have just a purely human mindset in all this, I would be anxious about my Lisu converts. 
afraid for their falling back into demon worship. But God is enabling me to cast all my care upon him. I'm not anxious and I'm not nervous. In that moment, he said, I mean, you see what he says here? I could have experienced great anxiety and fear of what, would ha- what could have happened, but I didn't. Well, what's, what's more is that, you know, he, Fraser died possibly not knowing the full extent of his ministry and the full long-term results of his little experiment. See, while he served in China in the early half of the, of the 1900s, in the last half of the 1900s, China experienced a massive revival, people turning to Christ. In fact, China, the country of China, probably is the pocket of strongest Christianity. We just don't know it because in so many places the church is so persecuted and so it's so much underground. But there was this massive revival of people turning to Christ, even amid government opposition. And researchers who kind of see the, 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 the spread of the gospel of Jesus in China have traced it back to those Highlander Christians who in the foothills of the Himalayas in their winter seasons of spiritual growth. So we're talking about prayer. And for me, you know, I shared a little bit last week that prayer is hard for me. And part of the reason it's hard is because I'm a doer, I'm a thinker, and I'm a strategist. I want to get busy, get to work, not waste any time, and with the most strategic possible, uh, you know, st- st- the, the most strategic options as possible, and do it the best ways. I'm just ready to, like, jump in there and go. And sometimes God says, just stop and pray. Interesting that he would, he said that he would have let anxiety ruin him, but he found a deep trust in the power of God through prayer. So last weekend we launched 40 days. And, uh, and, and what I did is I challenged all of us as a church to pray today. I challenged all of us to pray for five minutes every day through the presidential elections, knowing, knowing that kind of t- times are crucial and critical, and um, that, that, that part of the challenge for us and what we're kind of feeling and sensing these days is that it is time for us to get busy praying and seeking the Lord in desperate, heartfelt, fervent prayer. Many of you took the challenge. In fact, we've got about 200 people or so who said, I'll do it. I will commit myself for the next 40 days to pray for five minutes every day or however long the Lord leads me to pray if it's even longer than that, and I am going to pray. By the way, it is not too late for you to let us know if you are praying or if you're just joining us for the first time today and through the course of today, maybe God puts it on your heart that, you know what, seven days have already gone, but that's all right. Um, We've got about 30 days now until the presidential election, and I will pray. I'm going to pray for what God can do. Here's the best way to know that you're going to, to let us know that you will pray with us today, is just send a quick text message. That's how we're communicating these days. Numbers there on the screen, 360-552-7794, and in there just say, I will pray today. And to everybody who commits to it, um, we're sending out a couple of times a week uh, some encouraging Bible verses, reminders to pray, and um, <clears throat> tell you what, I'd, I'd love to hear about how your prayer life has been affected this week. Maybe even this week, after seven days, you realize, man, something's going on in my own heart. Tell us about it. Like, you could even, you know, right now send us a text message to that number and just tell us what's happening in your own life this week and some good news that might encourage others on the journey as well. We are praying, we're praying, we're praying. And today, the question we're going to ask is this. This is the big question for today. Does prayer really make a difference? Or shouldn't I be doing something? Should we really just sit back and pray? Or shouldn't we be doing something? Well, here's how I want us to kind of maybe, maybe we'll think about this today and approach this. When you watch the news, scroll through your news feed, and you're looking at the news and the headlines and the stories of what's happening, what are we seeing? Here's what I'm seeing. Three words that just came to mind this week. We are seeing overwhelm. People absolutely overwhelmed by bad news and bad events and bad things that are happening. And when you're overwhelmed, you just don't have the capacity or the energy to handle what is happening, and you just, you just so overwhelm. I'm seeing anxiety. Um, just in another conversation earlier this week, saying, I'm mean, just looking at all the news that's happening. It's bringing up so much anxiety of what might happen and what is happening and all the kind of consequences for that. Overwhelm, anxiety, and anger. I'm just angry by what I'm seeing. A lot of you shared with me in the last couple weeks. You're just angry. And you think about that. When we're feeling overwhelmed, what are going to be the results of that? When you're feeling overwhelmed, it's easy to just feel paralyzed. 
I don't know what to do because I see, feel so, so, you know, so unable to do anything. So I'm feeling overwhelmed, therefore paralyzed. And I've got this anxiety and I don't know what to do, but what I'm finding myself doing is arguing with the people around me. And when you've got overwhelm, anxiety, and anger, you see yourselves fighting with the people around you. Does that kind of sum up what we are seeing, experiencing, and hearing around us? Overwhelm, anxiety, and anger leading to being paralyzed, arguing, and fighting. That's what's all over the news, isn't it? Keep that in mind. Let me read a Bible story to you. And I'm just going to straight read it out of Scripture. I want you to imagine it. Maybe, in fact, maybe better, we'll have the words on the screen, but maybe better than reading along with me, maybe just close your eyes and you just let this, this scene, this episode, play out in your mind and just watch how it happens. It comes from 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I'll set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. And time and again, Elisha, the prophet, the man of God, he warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. That's the setup. Here it goes. Watch this. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and he demanded of them, tell me which one is on the side of the king of Israel? Who is the spy? Who is telling them where we are going to be and what we're going to do? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. So then he sent horses, and chariots, and a strong force there. They went by night and they surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the, the small city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike this army with blindness. And so he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road. This is not the city. Follow me. I'll lead you to the man you're looking for. This is great. Seriously, this is the Bible, right? It's awesome. And he led them to Samaria, the capital city. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria, doors locked, the army of Israel surrounding them. When the king of Israel saw this, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? What, what shall I do? You just led the enemy right into our city, and now they're blind. What should we do? We've got them in a position of vulnerability. Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Isn't that an awesome story? Straight up right from the Bible right there. Blindness, prey, leads the enemy right into the city. And then there's not even like the wholesale slaughter that often really bothers us about the Bible. You know, Elisha's like, no, just like let God do his thing. Feed them, give them their food, send them home, blessed, somewhat embarrassed and shamed, realizing that they are totally on the wrong side. They don't ever want to be caught like this again. It's going to be fine. And they ended up leaving them alone maybe for decades, a long, a long time. But, but look at the story here, okay? See, see here... Elisha, though he is surrounded by a powerful army in the small little city, he's not overwhelmed. He's not filled with anxiety. He's not filled with anger. Why? Look at verse 17. When his, when his assistant says, what are we going to do? There's so many of them. 
Look at, in verse, it's verse 17 here. In fact, tell you what, I want you to read this with me. If you can see this and read this, come on, read it out loud with me. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God, open his eyes. God opened his eyes, and when God's op- God opens the eyes of the assistant, the apprentice to the prophet, he sees the resources that God is providing. God opened his eyes, and he saw the resources of God, and when he saw the incredible resources of God that far outnumbered the army of the Arameans, the Elisha servant, he walked away that day with a newfound confidence in God. Why? Because he saw God's unlimited resources that won the battle that day. Now, this is a little bit tough for us to imagine. And if you're brand new to faith or you're just checking out faith or somebody dragged you to church today and you're not sure of this whole business, you look at this and you're like, that doesn't make any sense at all. And I agree. In our modern scientific worldview, this doesn't really make any sense. In our world in which everything has a scientific explanation, like we don't really believe that when it rains, it's because God is crying and it's tears from heaven. We have, we have theories about like dew points and humidity and water and all that kind of stuff. And we can explain why it rains. So in our scientific worldview, this doesn't really make sense. I mean, they probably could not have gotten some scientists and gotten like metal detectors, sent them up on the hills to sense the presence of metal on the chariots. They probably couldn't have gotten thermometers to walk around and sense a significant rise in temperature of these chariots of fire. That would be a scientific kind of thing, but done by observation. He says, Lord, open his eyes And the servant sees something that can't be seen with human eyes, human sight, that doesn't quite make sense in our scientific worldview. But that's exactly what I want to challenge today. You see, it's not just our scientific worldview. It's our... What's something else? It's our primary, what I believe is our primary cultural idol. What would happen if you and I would begin to pray, Lord, open my eyes? that maybe we could see the hills full of chariots, of God's amazing resources? What would it look like for you as you're praying, Lord, open my eyes, because I want to see your unseen spiritual resources that are so much more than anything I could generate or collect. But I believe one of the reasons we don't even pray that prayer is because, let's be honest here, our primary cultural idol is self-sufficiency. Oh, we call it personal responsibility because that sounds a lot better, but let's be honest. Personal responsibility is good and it's a good thing. But for many of us in our culture, especially with our scientific worldview that has for the most part kind of pushed God out of the question, you can believe in him and have religion and all right, but like daily life, you need to be personally personally responsible. And we have taken the virtue of personal responsibility and turned it into an idol called self-sufficiency. I mean, think about it. When you get sick, the first place you run to is not a place of prayer. You run to the doctor. And I am so glad for doctors and medical knowledge and a really strong healthcare system. I'm so thankful for it. But let's be honest. We run to the doctor before we run to prayer. We go to prayer when the doctor doesn't work. You, you, you work hard and you will go to a job you hate because it is a stable job that provides a stable income for your family because you believe in providing for your family being responsible. And that's good. You should do that. And I'm so glad that we have a strong economy that can provide stable jobs, low unemployment, and good retirement systems. But let's be honest. It leads to self-sufficiency in which we don't pray very often for our daily bread because we have weeks of daily bread in the pantry. Healthcare, strong economy, all these things, they're not bad things. But you put them all together, let's be honest, most of us, if we don't bow at the altar of self-sufficiency, every one of us is tempted on a regular basis. 
And maybe we don't see the hills full of chariots because we don't really need them. We're taking care of things on our own, and because we don't need them, we can't see them. Next episode. Let me just tell you about it. It's amazing. So several years later, however many years later, they're back. The Arameans obviously did not learn their lesson the first time, so now they are back. And now they go to the city of Samaria, the capital city, and they invade the city. And they've got a, kind of got a good plan. Rather than walk in and have their in, army invade and start killing people on day one and try to you know, and risk a whole bunch of their losing their own armies, here's what they do. They surround the city, they cut off its food supply, and they just starve it out. And as long as the army outside of the, witty, the city can outlast the people inside of the city, they can win, and eventually they're hungry, they're starved, and they will just surrender and win with minimal loss of life to their own soldiers. And so they're outside besieging the city, starving out the city. And we are told in the story, and I'm just going to kind of use maybe dollars and cents instead of silver and shekels and all that, because it's hard for us to understand that. We're told that basically inside of the city, all the food is gone, everything is gone, and now they're looking for anything that might possibly have any nutritional value value and the head of a donkey sells for a thousand dollars oh gross but i guess there's some food value in that i don't know the head of a donkey sells for a thousand dollars a quarter of a pound of cheap nasty seeds sells for eleven dollars the king is walking around inside the city worried he doesn't know what to do a lady in the city screams at him sees that he's the king and says hey can you help me please help me and he discovers that they have hit an all-time low and that they have turned to cannibalism just to survive. And she says, can you help do something? And he looks at her and says, I can't help you. God himself's going to have to help you. That's all we have left. And rather than hitting his knees in prayers, it turns him angry. He says, you know, there's that guy, Elisha, and Elisha's a prophet, and he's the one who serves this God who's abandoned us, that isn't sending us food, and we're starving to death because this prophet isn't helping us. And so he decides that today is the day he's going to take Elisha's life. And so he gets his commander of the army, and they make their way to the house where Elisha is hanging out with the elders. And Elisha senses that something is going to happen, and he tells the elders, the king is coming, and he's going to take my life today. Protect me. The king and his servant, they get to the door. And Elisha says, stop, I know what you want, but here's the word from the Lord. And God gives him a word from the Lord that at least buys a little bit of time. And he says, by this time tomorrow, God is going to rescue us. And here's going to be the sign of that. By this time tomorrow, 12 pounds of the finest flour will sell for $2.25. No more goat, no more donkey heads for us. The king's assistant, who is hungry, who's been paying a lot of money for not really food that's nutritious at all. He cannot believe it, refuses to believe it, and here's what he says. Chapter 7, verse 2, The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, could this happen? Ha, 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 ha. In other words, does God himself really have the resources to give us some food so that, a 20 pound, so that 10 pounds of the finest flour would sell for a little, just a couple of dollars? Really, could God himself even pull that off? And Elisha turns to him and says, eh, you'll see. But you yourself won't eat any of it, but you will see. Overnight, there's a group of lepers who are sleeping by the city. They technically have to be outside of the city because they are outcasts and not allowed to come into the city. So they are hanging as close to the city gate as possible. That night, they are so hungry that they are like, you know what, what's the worst that could happen is they're going to kill us. We're going to die anyways. So let's go out to the Arameans. Let's surrender to them. And maybe they won't kill us. Maybe they'll give us a little bit to eat. So these lepers, they walk into the camp of the army that has surrounded the city and they discover that there is no one there. And they walk through and they start eating anything they want. They start taking anything they want. They find a bunch of gold and silver and they start plundering and taking all the stuff that's just kind of right there. They hide some of it for themselves and then they come to their senses and they're like, you know what, we should probably tell the king inside the city at least to save our own necks. And so they go up to the city gates and they find the, the, the gatekeepers and they say, hey, there's nobody out here. The whole camp, the army, everybody is gone. Word gets back to the king and the king says, I think it might be a trap. They've just kind of like backed off. They're hiding. They're waiting for us all to come out because we're so desperate and hungry. And as soon as we come out, then they're going to pounce on us and invade us. So send some chariots out to inspect. So they send a group of soldiers on chariots out, and they discover that sure enough, the camp has been abandoned. 
They look and they can't find Aramean soldiers hiding anywhere, but they see the highway that is leading out of town. And as they follow the highway, they see that there is, that there, that there is stuff, that there is food, that there are weapons that are strewn all over the highway as if the soldiers ran for their lives, throwing off anything that was holding them back. The people go out, they eat, they're satisfied. Another miracle from God. The people were overwhelmed, filled with anxiety, even with anger. And what do they see? They see God and his power and his resources come through for them and they are, then they survive. Now again, how do we explain all this? We don't know how to explain all this. But we know that God can do this kind of stuff. In fact, maybe what you could do this week in, in some of our you know, suggested Bible readings with our discussion questions that you could download from the website, I want you to read chapter 6 and chapter 7 again and look at some of these stories and maybe you'll read the chapters before and after and see all that God does that is completely unexplainable with our kind of scientific, rational worldview. We don't know how to explain it, but we do believe this, that we believe that God can. Now here's, I'm going to push you a little bit today. We believe that God is real. And if we believe that God is real, it seems to make sense that if God is real, even though he's unseen and we can't see him, that he's there, that God is real and he really loves us and he is good. It's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to think that if God is real, that he also could have some angels or some spirits who are his messengers who help him out and do his work in the world, that it's reasonable to believe, you know, it's just not too much of a stretch to believe that that there are these good spirits, good angels, right? Well, a lot of people believe in God, believe in angels. Now, we believe that God is good, and that he's good all the time, and that everything God does is good, and yet there is evil in the world, and so there's got to be some, some source, there's got to be some, like, some, some you know, it, it's not hard for us to imagine that evil is real, and God is not evil, doesn't have anything to do with evil. And so, if God is real, and if God has angels... It's really not too much of a stretch of the imagination to believe that there is this spiritual force for evil. We call him the devil, Satan. And if we can believe that God exists and he's good and he has good angels, messengers, that evil is real and that there's kind of the leader of evil in the universe who is also unseen and his name is the devil, that it's not too much of a stretch to believe that he also might have angels, messengers on his side who are working for evil. And even though we can't see this or experience it with our senses, it's not too much of a stretch to believe that it is all real if we can believe in God and his angels. We just don't want to. It's just uncomfortable to think of like evil and evil beings and evil spirits and demons. It's just weird and uncomfortable and we don't understand it. Therefore, we just don't, we just kind of like to ignore it. But we can think through, yeah, it makes sense. It, makes, it helps these stories make sense if we were to believe something like that. You know what else it helps to make sense? Of the news that we see. We look back and we see, why couldn't these countries just drop their borders, get along, and choose to cooperate instead of killing each other over constantly moving borders every year? There's some, like, there's some unseen spiritual force that is driving them to disagree, that is driving them to pride and anger and selfishness, that is causing them to war against each other, even though it doesn't make any sense at all. There is some force for evil, and it is winning sometimes, whether we like it or not. There is a spiritual enemy that is causing us to believe lies that cause us then to hate each other, even to fight each other and to kill each other. So we get to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he, he kind of affirms this, and I re really like how he puts this. It's kind of a classic passage here. Here's what, he, here's what we find in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. He gets to the end of this letter, and he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in his mighty power. Now, we like that, don't we? We like that encouragement. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in his mighty power. All of us can get into that. I want to be strong, and I want to be strong in the Lord. I want to be strong in his mighty power. And look what he says right after it, okay? Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Uh-oh, now we've got to talk about some of this weird stuff like the devil and demons and all that. But look what he says. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual... Sorry, our... 
Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So that when you and I read the news, we read all these bad stories of all this bad stuff going around. And every news story wants to identify the villain who is responsible and who is the source and the agent of all this bad stuff. The Apostle Paul comes to us and he says, remember, if God and his angels exist and we can't see them, there's a devil and his angels and we don't like this. It makes us feel really uncomfortable. But the enemy, the real villain, the real perpetrator behind all of this, is there an unseen spiritual force working against God and righteousness and goodness? Therefore, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Not against people. The real enemy, he doesn't have a face. She doesn't have a face. And if there is a real spiritual enemy, then we are somehow in a battle between good and evil. And if there is a real spiritual enemy, if we are somehow in a battle between good and evil, then this battle is going to be won through God's power, not through our own intelligence, might, or power. And what I want you to consider today is that battle is fought and won on our knees. We are tempted to think that the battle for truth is won in arguments, debates, and teaching. I'd like you to consider that the battle for truth is won on our knees by the power of God. We like to think that the battle for love and compassion is won through compassion in relationships and showing love. And while that's important, really the battle for love and compassion is won on our knees. We like to think and it's easier to think, and we're tempted to think, that the battle for political justice and political righteousness is won at the ballot box. But I'd like you to consider that the battle for political justice and righteousness in a nation is won on our knees. We like to think that the battle for cultural influence and the battle for our culture is won through becoming a cultural influencer. And I'd like you to consider that the battle for our culture is won first and foremost on your knees. Think about this. If the battle is won on your knees, then after you have won the battle on your knees, then you can get up and go in the confidence of God because you have seen the chariots on the hills. And you can go in the confidence of God and do whatever he tells you to do with confidence. And when he tells you to go vote and who to vote for, you go vote and you vote for that person. When he tells you to engage our culture, you engage our culture with whatever he gives you and tells you to do. When he tells you to shut your mouth, not share that meme on Facebook, you shut your mouth and don't share that meme on Facebook because you've already won the battle on your knees. And when he says speak up and debate, you speak up and debate with love and kindness because you're only doing what the Lord has told you to do because you already won the battle on your knees. And let me tell you, as we win the battle on our knees, we begin to reject the idol of self-sufficiency. And we begin to say, I can't do anything on my own. I am not sufficient on my own. I can't do anything unless directed by God, with the power of God, with God going before me. I got to win the battle first on my knees and then I take action. So last week we said, hey, 40 days, right? Well, now it's 30 days until a presidential election. There's 30 more days. And I want to encourage you today that if you're sensing overwhelm over this issue of the election, if you're sensing anxiety, if you're sensing anger, it's time to hit your knees. But however the spiritual battle is fought, whatever is the battle here, God knows what the battle is and that we're going to win our battle on our knees. Because you know what? We don't just pray. I mean, here's the good news today. We don't just pray in order to find out what to do. And as soon as we have marching orders, then we go do it. And so the purpose of prayer is to find out what to do. Like God does lead us with what we are supposed to do, but it's bigger than that, right? Because what you'll do then, as soon as you know what to do, you'll just stop praying and go do it on your own strength and power. 
But here's the good news today. Here's what I want you to get today. Here's what I want you to walk away with today. This is a challenge to all of our modern scientific worldview kind of thinking. Here's the good news. When you and I pray with passion and fervency, you are making a difference when you pray, as you pray, and because you pray. That change is happening in the universe as we pray. Think about that. We think nothing changes until we get to action and say something and do something. God says, change is happening in the universe when and because we pray. And if you want to see real change, you hit your knees and pray with passion and fervency. Because sometimes, sometimes when you pray with passion, Sometimes your own eyes are opened and you see for the first time the chariots on the hills. And you're changed. Sometimes as you pray, the people around you, their eyes are opened like the servant. And they see the chariots full of hills. And they're changed. Sometimes as you pray, believe it or not, because you pray, the ears of your enemies who have a face Their ears are opened and they begin to hear the truth of God over the untruth of the devil. They begin to hear, maybe for the first time in their lives, the wisdom of God over the foolishness of the other voices that they are hearing. And their ears are opened for truth because you prayed. And sometimes, believe it or not, because you are prayed, some people are mysteriously convinced to vote for the person they were not going to vote for. And that the outcomes of national elections have been changed because God's people won the battle on their knees more than mailers, announcements, and advertisements. If God can do it with soldiers and chariots in the hills for the ancient people of Israel, he can do it for any other country in any other time, including our nation, including now. See, wouldn't it be great if for some reason, prayer, because you were praying, the voice of God's truth became louder in your friend's ear than the voice of untruth? Wouldn't it be amazing if hard hearts, hearts that are hardened towards their children, towards their spouses, towards their friends, to their employees, to their coworkers. Wouldn't it be great if hard hearts around us were softened? It won't be because you argued your way into soft-heartedness with the people around you. It'll be because God has this way of softening hearts. So why is it so hard to pray long and fervently? Because we're in a battle. And it's far easier to sit on the couch and watch TV than it is to suit up and go into battle. The last thing our spiritual enemy wants for us is to do battle on our knees and to pray in which for some reason when we pray, God moves. Why do we need to get busy and get praying? Because there is a real battle. We don't have to get all weird about it and we don't have to give the demons names. I mean, you, you, you can do that if that's where kind of God leads you. You don't have to kind of go to the extremes with this. Just know that when you pray, and you pray fervently, you are engaging in a spiritual battle. Things are changing in the universe. You prayed five minutes every day this week, maybe for the first time ever, and it was hard, but things changed in the universe because you prayed. Why is it hard to pray long and fervently? Maybe it's because you're fighting the battle alone. You've heard the phrase, I've got your back. We think that phrase comes from ancient combat in which soldiers who were fighting with the defensive weapon of a shield and the offensive weapon of a sword knew that they could defend their front side with their shield, but they were defenseless in their back. And so they would fight with the buddy system and one soldier would get the back of the other, of the other soldier. And in that buddy system, they would fight together and my shield would protect my front and your shield would protect you and my back and my shield would protect your back and we fight together. Could it be the same with prayer? 
If prayer is a battle, I believe it's easier to fight, and I have found that it is easier to fight the battle of prayer when we're praying with a buddy, when we are praying together. So I'm going to push you a little bit more this week. This week, not only are we going to continue to pray today, every day for five minutes, but I'm going to encourage you to pray with somebody. I'm going to encourage you to pray together this week. And maybe you and your spouse, I heard the story of it this week, families praying together, spouses praying for their five minutes a day together. Literally, I got your back in life and in prayer. So here's the other thing we've done today. Today, when you came in, you got this little card here. And we have talked to some of our folks. I said last week that over the last several months, God has been raising up people with hearts of prayer. And groups have been gathering just on their own. And it's really great to see it kind of happening just organically and people gathering for prayer. And this week, we're going to invite you. And those, those folks said, you know what? If anybody else from the church wants to come and join us for a time of prayer, we'll host that. And so on the back of this, we've got several prayer gatherings. We have one for almost every day of the week this week at different times of the day. In fact, there's even one that's online. If you don't feel safe and comfortable coming out of your home yet, you can join a Zoom prayer meeting and pray online and join the battle. And so at some point, I'm going to encourage you to take a look at this. And if God leads you, and if this is kind of touching, kind of ringing up, you know, kind of, kind of touching a soft spot in your heart, and God says, yeah, it's time for you to pray together with somebody else. I'm going to encourage you to check out one of these prayer gatherings this week, and let's pray today, every day. Let's pray with others, and let's do the battle on our knees, because the battle is won on your knees. What do you think? Ready for battle? I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back. We have plenty of time, so we're going to, we're going to pray. And I'm going to invite you today to not just pray, but invite you to do battle. And so I don't know what that looks like for you, but, but what, you know, one of the things that, that we do that's good to do when we pray is to, to use our imagination, okay? So what are we going to do? Let's, let, let's, let's stand together if, if, if you feel comfortable doing that. As the band leads and they're going to sing a song, they're singing a powerful worship song that says, Lord, you are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. You are the one who works in our behalf. You are the God of power, okay? We're going to pray today. We're going to pray together. And uh, I'm going to encourage you to pray. Maybe you found that these, uh, these prayer altars here are a great place to pray and to gather and to pray. And so, you know, earlier this morning, I said, you know what, if we're going to talk about this, I really need some, you know, support and some prayer. And three of these guys, they joined me at 730 this morning before the band started. And we just gathered and we kneeled and we prayed and we prayed together. And it was a wonderful time of prayer, right, Toby? Good time, man. Hey, these guys are going to lead us. You can sing way more than sing. And I want you to pray. Maybe you just sit at your seat. Maybe you come pray here. Maybe you kneel at your seat. But here's what I want you to do. Bow your heads with me. I want you to imagine yourself suiting up for battle. What does that look like for you to suit up for a spiritual battle that's not won with regular old weapons because our enemy is not flesh and blood? 